Hello and welcome back. Today I want to conclude the discussion about DC biasing of transistor amplifiers by looking at some active stabilization methods. Now normally active means that you will be using an electronic circuit that employs active components, but I also want to look at active in the sense of what you can do as a designer and builder to actively obtain better performance. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So in the previous two episodes, where we looked at bipolar transistors and field effect transistors, there were two big problems that made the circuit's operating point unpredictable. On the one side, you have the initial parameter spread of the transistors, so the way they come from the manufacturer, mainly the gain of the bipolar transistor and the transconductance and threshold voltage for the field effect transistor. And the other big issue was that the parameters were not stable so they are highly temperature dependent. So the general rule to stabilize the transistor amplifier circuit is to use negative feedback in one way or another. The more the parameters can spread and vary, the more feedback is needed to ensure reliable operation. But what else can be done? Well, let's take the problems one at a time. Now, one way of tackling the parameter spread is by binning which means that the components are measured by the manufacturer and then separated into separate classes. One example can be observed in this BC817 transistor datasheet, where based on the current gain, you have four varieties. You've got the unbinned version of the 817, which has a gain somewhere between 100 and 600, so a one to six variation in gain, which doesn't really matter if you're using the transistor as a simple switch. But then you also have these three other categories, where the gain is a bit more tight. So in case you're building something where gain actually matters, like an amplifier, you can go for one of these categories of transistors. Now the binned version of a transistor will usually be more expensive than the unbinned version, since this requires an extra separation step, and you can rely on the manufacturer to do this, or for hobby circuits or very small scale manufacturing, you can do the separation by yourself. So you can measure the transistors that you intend to use to determine their exact parameters or separate them into far more tighter bins. You do have multimeters which are more or less expensive and therefore work more or less better that can perform this task. However, these pieces of equipment will tell you the transistor parameters at whatever test conditions the meters are generating. If you want more useful results, you can make the measurement yourself at the exact intended use case so the intended operating point conditions. Now, if you want to determine the parameters of a transistor at its operating point in the circuit simulator, you're gonna need to set up something like this. So you can supply the collector of the transistor with the intended collector emitter voltage for bipolar, or you can supply the drain of the transistor in a field effect transistor, again with the intended drain source voltage, and to figure out at what driving signal you're actually getting the desired current, you can sweep an input signal. So if we run this simulation, Let's just look at the bipolar transistor. We can look at the collector current, and rather than plotting against time, you can plot against the base current. So you can see at what base current you're reaching your intended collector current, and well, based on the ratio of the two, you can figure out the exact gain under these operating conditions. For field effect transistors, it's much the same story. It's just that rather than looking at gate current, you're looking at gate voltage. And of course, for depletion mode transistors, you will need negative voltages. Now, in real life, the setup looks very similar to this one. So for a bipolar transistor, you will be using a fixed supply voltage to generate the collector emitter voltage and measuring the collector current using a dedicated ammeter. And then you will have a secondary ammeter in the base of the transistor. And while well, to set the base driving signal, you will be using some sort of potentiometer. Of course, you can use an extra series resistor just to limit the available voltage that can be supplied into the transistor, so you don't risk destroying it. In a similar fashion, the setup for the field effect transistor contains an ammeter in the drain, but this time a voltmeter in the gate, so to measure the gate source voltage. And finally, for the depletion mode transistor, you keep the voltmeter in the gate, so between the gate and the source, but the potentiometer with which you set the gate voltage 
needs to also be supplied from a negative supply voltage. So other than your dedicated drain source voltage, you will also need some sort of supply to generate negative voltages. So this technique of determining the exact parameters of the transistor under the operating conditions can be especially useful in things like push-pull amplifiers, where you usually need at least two transistors to have matching characteristics. If you measure the transistors, you can very easily select two of them that have the exact properties, or at least very close ones. Another approach is, rather than having fixed component values, use variable ones. So you can use either a variable resistor, ring potentiometer, in the gate or base resistor divider, so usually you will also want to leave some other resistors here just to limit the exact value that can be adjusted, or you can simply connect this to another supply line, and well, if you want to supply depletion mode transistors, you will need a negative supply. But with all of these adjustment possibilities, there are two big benefits. On the one side, you can compensate the initial parameters of the transistors, so you can be closer to the desired operating point without having to handpick components. And on the other hand, if your circuit is being used for extensive periods of time, you can perform periodic calibrations. So all components age. Semiconductors are not an exception. And sometimes, if precision is important, calibration will be necessary. Now, let's look at some proper electronic compensation methods. First problem to tackle, temperature. This is a major issue specifically with bipolar transistors, since there, with increasing temperature, you get increasing currents. So, you run the risk of a thermal runaway. Which is a bad thing. So, whatever compensation circuit is used, the higher the temperature of the transistor is, the lower the driving voltage should be to keep the collector current constant or at least under some degree of control. And one basic way of implementing this is by adding components into the feedback network. So if you add a PN diode, the voltage drop on it is temperature dependent with a negative temperature coefficient. So when you increase temperature, the voltage on the diode will drop and so will the voltage available to drive the transistor. This effect can be enhanced by using multiple diodes in series. The exact number of diodes will be dependent on the exact temperature coefficient of the diode and the gain variation of the transistor. Now, to get more exact matches, you might end up needing non-integer number of diodes. And for that, we can build the circuit around an extra transistor. So if we place a voltage divider around this transistor, the voltage drop on the transistor will be equal to its base emitter voltage and the ratio of resistors. So you can get a transistor to behave as a number of diodes, which can be non-integer. Now, the important thing to remember about this type of compensation method, so either with diodes or with transistors, is that the compensation component needs to be in thermal contact with the compensated component. So these two need to be in close proximity one to the other. If a heatsink is used for the compensated component, then the compensation component will also need to be placed on that heatsink. And to evaluate this method, I prepared a set of circuits. So they're all using the exact same transistor, all supplied from the same supply voltage. We're only looking at the operating point at two temperature extremes, minus 20 and plus 80. So if we run the simulation and we look at our reference circuit, so the current going through the collector, we can see that the current is varying based on temperature by about 1.3 milliamps. So this is the delta current between minimum and maximum temperature. Now, if we look at our second circuit, so the one that has one diode in the feedback network, we can see that we are close to the same target value, so close to 49 milliamps, but the variation is much smaller this time. So we only have about 580 microamps of current variation. Now, if we take this one step further, so put two diodes instead of one diode, and we look again at the collector current. So there's two things to notice here. On the one side, we are doing better. We only have 250 microamps of current variation, but this current variation now starts to decrease. So before we had increasing current with increasing temperature, now we have decreasing current with increasing temperature. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, so this will prevent any thermal runaway, but if we want to stabilize the current as close as possible to a flat line, we don't want this. So one diode in the feedback network is not enough, but two diodes is too much. So the final circuit that I prepared 
has a transistor in the feedback network, so this is just a random transistor from the LDSpice library, and I prepared a resistive divider to drive it. Now if we look at the current running through this transistor, we can now see an almost perfectly flat line. So if I put two cur cursors on the extreme values, we can see that we barely have about 10-11 microamps of current variation. So if you fine-tune the values, you can get extremely stable circuits using this method. It's just that to have good correspondence in real life to the simulation, you also need very good simulation models for the used components. Just because it works very nicely in the simulation doesn't mean it will work just as well in real life. This idea of input signal variation with temperature can be expanded upon. Rather than driving the amplifier from a fixed supply voltage, you can use a variable one and make the supply voltage temperature dependent. So either with diodes or transistors, or by using an NTC type component. Now, while doing research on the topic, the most interesting circuit I found works something like this. So you measure the current that is consumed by the circuit and you compare it to a reference voltage. And based on the comparison result of these two, you drive the transistor. Now, this takes the idea of negative feedback one step further by using another amplifier to compensate the error present in the first transistor. So the big advantage with this principle of operation is that the stabilized transistor's parameters no longer matter, as long as the comparator and the reference are stable. In other words, this should keep a transistor at an intended bias point, regardless of transistor parameters, temperature, or, well, even transistor type. The most basic way to implement this idea can be done using a resistor divider to provide the reference voltage, a collector resistor to perform the current measurement, and an extra PNP transistor to perform the comparison. The idea here being that as long as the voltage drop on the collector resistor is smaller than the voltage drop on the reference minus the voltage drop on the base emitter junction of the PMP transistor, the PMP transistor will be conducting, thus driving more voltage into the controlled transistor. This of course will increase the collector current, so the voltage drop on the collector resistor will increase and at some point the circuit will stabilize. The way you calculate the circuit is that the voltage drop on your reference needs to be equal to the voltage drop on the measurement resistor plus the voltage drop on the base emitter of the PMP transistor. So with this in mind, if the resistor divider that is driving the control transistor allows it, you can set any bias point, regardless of the parameters of the controlled transistor. So to test out the circuit, I prepared a simulation. On the one hand, we have two circuits with two different transistors, so different grades of the same transistor where only a passive network is used, and then we have our active circuit where the same two different transistors are used, but the same active compensation method is implemented. So if we run the simulation, so again we're simulating between minus 20 and plus 80 degrees, with the passive stabilization, we are getting quite a bit of current spread. So current is temperature dependent, but it's also varied by almost 2 milliamps based on the initial gain of the transistor. If we now look at our active circuit, so first of all it's highly temperature dependent, but we'll get back to this. However, if we compare the performance of the two different gain transistors, we can see that the current variation between transistors is much much smaller. Now the reason why we're getting such a large variation in current is because our comparator element, the transistor, and especially its base emitter voltage are temperature dependent. So the forward voltage of the PN junction is part of our comparison result. And since this is temperature dependent, well, so is the operation of the circuit. So to compensate for this, we can use the diode trick that we've looked at before and simply insert another diode in the reference voltage. So have the reference temperature dependent. If we do this and look at the currents running through the transistors, we can see we keep our small variation with the transistor's gain, but we've also stabilized the temperature variation. So it's not perfect, but if we compare it to our initial circuit, the green and blue line, so the circuits with the active stabilization with the diode in the feedback network, are working much, much better. But wait, there's more. <laughs> 
This circuit will not just work on bipolar transistors, the same basic idea applies to enhancement mode field effect transistors. And it will work with depletion mode transistors if a negative supply is present. And this is really the beauty of the circuit. It does not really matter what type of transistor it's driving. And to illustrate these possibilities, I prepared this set of three simulations. So we have the same basic circuit for a bipolar transistor as for an enhancement mode field effect transistor, as well as a depletion mode field effect transistor. So if we run the circuits, so as before we have a fairly stable current on the bipolar transistor, using the exact same components in the feedback network, we're getting almost exactly the same current for the enhancement mode field effect transistor. And for the depletion mode transistor, well, first of all, I use the negative supply voltage, so we have this minus 10 volt supply. And we also have slightly different component values because this particular transistor can't really handle 50 milliamps. But regardless, you can make quite a stable circuit at a different current. So regardless of the type of transistor you are driving, you can use this type of active biasing. This basic idea of measuring a current and driving a transistor to be stabilized can be of course improved. You can replace your PMP transistor with an op amp, you can replace your reference circuit with a proper precision reference, and finally you can replace your measurement resistor with a small shunt resistor. So this small shunt resistor will of course work best with the op amp implementation. So this will be able to work with very small voltages. But regardless, for me, the basic idea of the transistor comparator with the basic reference, with or without the diode, is the most interesting because of its simplicity. It's not perfect, but with just a few components, you are removing a lot of headaches. Now, while looking over some data sheets, I came across this one. So this is the Agilent ATF54143, which I'm not sure if it's still being produced or not. But one of the interesting things in this datasheet is that it contains this exact type of active biasing circuit. So we have the transistor that is supposed to be biased, and then we have the PMP and the various components around it. Now, the reason why I'm bringing up this circuit is that other than the, well, DC stabilizing circuitry, there's all sorts of other components being used here. So you've got various LC filters and RC filters and so on. And the point here being that the DC stabilizing circuit is supposed to do just that, stabilize the DC operating point. It should not be involved in the radio frequency signal passing through the transistor. So for that, you will need to add various types of filters to isolate the high frequency part from the DC stabilizing part. So this is a topic to keep in mind with any of the DC stabilizing methods that we've looked at during this series. There are of course other active methods to control and stabilize transistor amplifiers, but the ones I showed were the ones that I personally found the most interesting. However, setting the DC bias point and passing some radio frequency signal through the transistor amplifier are two completely separate and somewhat independent topics. DC biasing is extremely important, but just because you finish stabilizing the transistor at DC does not mean you're done with the amplifier design. But looking at how signals can be passed through the amplifier is a topic for another time. So for now, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.